I'm talking about a clit talk, clit talk, clit talk, talking about a clit talk, clit talk, clit talk. <laughs> Clitorati! We have a very exciting guest today and next week. She's a sexual freedom philosopher and the author and illustrator of The Orgasm Book, Oh, the places you'll go, oh, oh, where she's been coined the Dr. Seuss of sex, and she's the woman who's interviewing men in bubble baths about what it means to be a man. And, I mean, this is why we're doing two episodes with her. She's also the leader of Girls Who Say Fuck, your gateway to getting weird. I am so excited for this. Please welcome to the Clit Talk studio, Nicole Hodges. Hello. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Um, I do have to give one shout out. Um, my, I did not illustrate it. It came from my brain and I happened to find somebody who could take all the weird things in my brain and put it into illustration. So Jillian Mundy is the mm-hmm. illustrator of the orgasm book. Oh, the places you'll go. Oh, oh. Uh, we're working together on a couple other projects, including a small workbook for students on sexual debut. And I just got to say that it's so nice in this world when you find somebody who you send them weird sentences like, I need dripping orgasmic flowers against a backdrop of strange creatures called Coctothorps. And she goes, yeah, yeah, I got you. Ah! That kind of that kind of sounds like some of our meetings, actually. <laughs> I'm like, yep. Madison, can you make the font on the blowjob thing a little bigger for me? <laughs> exactly. The sentences that you type and you're like, God damn, I love my life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All the time. Well, it's so funny, and I love how I came across you, Nicole, because actually one of the men that you had interviewed, and I clicked on his profile because he said I was just interviewed in a bathtub, and I was like, what the hell is this? And I clicked on it, and there's this gorgeous man in a, in a bathtub and a woman like <laughs> sitting on the side holding a microphone up to his mouth, and I was like, who is this woman? I have to know her. We have to have her on the podcast. So I reached out to you uh, many months ago. Now we finally got you on. Um, And we're going to be doing a whole episode on the men in baths. We're going to talk really about all of your other projects today because you have got it going on. There are so many (laughs) exciting things to talk about. Um, So like I said, you've got so many incredible platforms all inside of the realm of sex and empowerment. How did this all get started? Like, what was your aha moment that made you say, okay, and I love this. I'm a sexual freedom philosopher. (laughs) Well, I mean, the the title Sexual Freedom Philosopher kind of came out of this obsession of needing to create some sort of title in this like floating space that I was in where I didn't know exactly what to call myself because there was no mm. word or person that I could look to or follow and go, yeah, okay, that's what I am. And um, I had a woman who came into my life serendipitously and she was like, well, you, you're just, I don't know, you're like a, like a sexual freedom philosopher. And I was like, oh, oh my God, I am. And I just decided it just, you know what it is? It's like sometimes when you set off on this journey of doing something differently, there's no blueprint, right? I mean, it's, you guys talk about no. uh, consensual ethical non-monogamy and it's the same thing with relationships that it is in life sometimes where you're just like, all right. I'm on this path. I'm putting one foot in front of the other. I'm essentially wandering around in the dark. I'm using my intuition for so much of this. And I have no, I have no idea where I'm going. And for some reason, sexual freedom philosopher just made me feel more comfortable in the kind of like not needing to know the answer and just being okay with asking the questions. Mm. Um, but I love that. Yeah. And, and, and what, which, which is, yeah, it's, I mean, the whole, and the whole sexual freedom thing is a lot to do with how much are we able to be ourselves, right? Like the will, the will to power, which, which Nietzsche talks about, it's like, are we living in a world that allows us to express ourselves as sexual beings fully? And when I kind of use that as my, my guiding question, I see where, where there's disconnects. Uh, and that's what I'm really interested in exploring is like, how much can we allow our inner world to match our outer world? How much can we align those two things? Um, and that's, that's kind of the quest that I'm on to put it succinctly to heal the divide. Mm. I can, we can relate to that so much because we always said like, we don't necessarily have the answers. We're just like regular women, but we're going to go out there and ask, we're going to go find the experts and ask the questions. And it is such a powerful place to come from. Like we, we, we were just 
um, interviewing one of our participants from our, our class and, and we really were distinguishing with her like curiosity is one of the sexiest traits you can have, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and one of the things that I also think is sexy is I love the word fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. And you have a whole, a whole movement. So girls who say fuck is, is a community that's really helping remember, helping women remember their power through the art of dominance and submission. Can you tell us more about this? Cause I'm like, I love to say fuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, uh, it's origin stories is, is, is interesting because it came at, a time in my life where I was completely dead inside and yet had everything that I thought I wanted. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I've, you know, I've, I've kind of spoken about this before, but I, I'm one of those lucky people who got the job of their dreams and then had the privilege of letting it go. So I don't really live in a world of what if, and what I wanted to do with my life is I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be a journalist and, and I wanted to be a television reporter. And I, I got that and I got that position in, you know, a major news network. And I had a seven year monogamous relationship. There was nothing fundamentally wrong with it. I was living in Vancouver in the city of my dreams. And I just, I felt nothing. Mm. And I decided to kind of swipe my hand across the table of my life and leave it all essentially all at once. And the only thing that I had was this name for a company or a movement or a community, I, I didn't know what it meant. And it was the, I, I kind of put it as like a flag in the air when I moved to Toronto and I was like, I run something called girls who say fuck. And everyone's like, cool. What is that? And I was like, I have no idea, but can we be friends then if you like it? And it was like <laughs> the only thing that I used to like find my people mm. was I would just go, I would just go out and I would meet people and they'd be like, what do you do? And I'd be like, I do absolutely nothing except I have this concept for a thing called girls who say fuck. And they'd either be like, Alrighty then, and we'd never talk, or they'd be like, "Cool, come to my dinner with my weird friends next week," <laughs> you know. And it's how I ended up. <laughs> it's how I ended up at Burning Man, and oh. you know, I grew up in a in a relatively, I mean, like a conservative small town, um, but it was more so that my my desire to be everything the opposite of my mother that then led me to like you know not try any drugs and be like really sexually repressed. Because I thought that if I did everything the opposite of her, I'd be happy. And so finally, when I when I kind of started to let that go and 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 ask myself the question like, what if everything you think you know about yourself is wrong? Um, I decided to do every single drug I could get my hand on over the course of the week at Burning Man. <laughs> and uh, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's not that hard. It was very easy. Um, <laughs> and you know, I I remember. I remember dancing on the deck of a submarine in the middle of the desert on MDMA for the first time and the sun was rising and it felt like I caught the sun in my ovaries mm. and it just like burned up all of the shame that I had been carrying with me for so long that I, that, that I didn't even know was there. And all of this feeling I had that like, oh, I can lobotomize my sexuality and it won't affect any other area of my life I realized that that was a complete fallacy and that, that all of these things are connected and that sexuality and sexual energy is such a potent life force and once I finally started letting that go I I, I you know in the truest sense stepped into my power mm -hmm. in that I bravely went off in search of myself as a sexually empowered being asking what does it mean to be free mm -hmm. I love so, that. And yeah, and so so girls who say fuck where it is today. I mean, girls who say fuck is quite honestly like the 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 evolution of self. And the reason I call it the gateway to getting weird is because it's what I would have wanted and needed when I was at that point in my life. And where I'm at in my life and what I'm able to provide through girls who say fuck is is the most authentic expression of me right now. Mm. And what me right now wants, therefore what I'm creating, is spaces for women to foster deeper fe female friendships within an erotic environment with undertones of BDSM where we practice the art of dominance and submission on each other so that we can embody dominance and submission within ourselves and then apply that to other areas of our life where we r realize that there is an imbalance in power. Mm, I love that. And 
you know, something that I, I love about your story so much is, you know, from, from when you shared how the sexual freedom philosopher just fell out of her mouth, like I have mm. it that that was channeled for you, like, and you, you trusting, you know, so one of our big mentors is mama Gina and she recommended, have you ever read the book, big magic? Uh, no, that's a okay. Elizabeth Gilbert. Is that Elizabeth her Gilbert? Book? Yeah. Yeah. It's her second book. So she has this concept that ideas are like these living kind of creatures that float through the air in the universe and it'll pop into your mind. Right. And you either take action on it or the idea will float off to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right. And we've all had that. Like you think of inventing someone, then you see it three years later, like someone, someone else invented it. Or like in her case, she had started writing this book and an author friend of hers, like wrote the exact same book because she never finished it. She's like, it was insane. And I just have it that there was this little idea that floated into your mind and without even knowing how it was going to unfold, you trusted your, we call it your pussy. Like you trusted your pussy or your intuition mm -hmm. and, and you just leaned into it. And sometimes people are, I love that you weren't stopped by the how to, or the, what exactly is it? Because a lot of times I think that can stop people from really leaning into like their authentic expression. So I love that you didn't stop the how to do this or what is it exactly? You just leaned into it and like your story is so incredible. So I just Thank want to you. acknowledge mm -hmm. you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd love to comment on two things that you said. Um, yeah. I hear the quote often, what is for you won't get by you. Mm -hmm. And in my brain, I always go, yes, but you still need a net. And I think that that's part of what this is. It's like your, not to say it's your, you, you can build the, the net completely based on intuition, but yes, there's an, there's ideas floating around us all the time, but you still, you still need to kind of like capture it. Right. And it, it can just easily flow by. I think yeah. that orgasms allow you to almost go into that meditative state where those creative ideas live. Like the realm of creativity can be accessed through, uh, transcendent states. And I believe that, um, orgasm is a transcendent state. I, I've done mm -hmm. a lot of research into things like, you know, can cervical orgasms cause the release of DMT? And we know that DMT is produced endogenously. And so it's like, I mean, we, we know that it's released during birth and that right. has, you know, that touches the, the cervix. That The cervix is very much involved in that process. So who's to say that cervical orgasms don't allow us to access those spaces? Mm. Um, and so, mm. yeah, there is a beautiful realm of creativity. And I love the way that, that you put that and the way that Elizabeth Gilbert put that. Um, the other thing that I really like to explore is this idea that your intuition is your future self whispering back to you. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Yes. So like, let's fuck with time a little bit here and say mm. that, you know, time is not linear, it's layered. So why, why can't that be the case? Mm. I, I would that. dare to say that it is the case mm. as long as you're mm -hmm. willing and open to receive it. Yeah. And to, to listening, right. And yeah. creating that space mm -hmm. to, to hear yourself speak from another place, beckoning I, you forward. Yep. And I do, and I do, I do feel that sense we have stepped into the realm of, oh, fuck no, pleasure is our birthright. We're going to like, what, what happens if you app, app, actually map pleasure into your life first and then make everything else work around it that my connection to my pussy and my intuition has gotten stronger. Like those whispers turn into like a little bit louder chatter. And then it's like, okay, I hear you. You know, when you're like what you were speaking to, when you're seemingly have all the materialistic things in the world, but you feel numb, mm -hmm. you're not hearing those whispers. No. Right? I mean, like my pussy yelled at me. It wasn't even a whisper. Like she wasn't even polite about it. I, I ignored her forever. And yeah. a defining moment in this shift that happened for me was uh, reading Come As You Are by Emily Nagowski. Nig yeah, Nagowski, I think. Nagowski, yeah. 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 Great book. And yeah. And you know, in the book, quite early on, she says, okay, I want you to stop and I want you to go look at your vulva and vagina in the mirror. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And, and I kept and I kept reading and she's like, hey, stop, go look. And I was like, oh my God, she can see me. She could, she can, she's going to be able to tell that I haven't done it. And so I went to the bathroom or sorry, to the, my bedroom and I sat on the floor and, you know, I had a full length mirror 
And I spread my legs and I looked at myself for the first time since I was 15 years old, the age that I locked myself sexually into a box. Mm. And I had this voice come like ripping through my brain that both was me and wasn't me that said, where the fuck have you been? I've been waiting for you. I'm so glad you're here now. We need to talk. And I was like, and I just, I started bawling my eyes out because I was like, what Mm. is this power that I've been denying myself? And it was from that day that I started having conversations Mm. with, with my pussy that made me realize that, you know, all things really are connected and, and there is such immense power in slowing down and listening. Like you said, Katie, right? Just like listening to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, girl, you're like, preaching where does to that the come choir. From? <laughs> and and yeah. the cool thing is, is that everyone listening, like every woman has access, every vulva owner has access to this. So, mm. and I would like, even well, venture to say anyone, unlock? I would say anyone with genitals has access to this too, because I think men are not exempt from this country. I think our true. Country, country conversation. <laughs> <laughs> You're certainly not. Men are in exile. <laughs> Woman island. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, I mean, I think because I had my partner do it and he had like a really healing experience too. I would say anyone with genitals has access to connecting to, because I do believe your genitals are access to your source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I would would agree with that too. Wow. I haven't, you know, I really like, I haven't thought much about how men can have that experience with their genitals. And I, and I, I don't know why I'm, I I've been more connected to helping women heal, um, or creating opportunities for women to have those conversations with themselves Mm. and just haven't felt as strongly about men almost having like meditative masturbation experiences. Um, and I wonder, I wonder why that is. Well, Mm. it's because your pussy's not yelling at you about that yet. (laughs) Yeah, or at all. I'm I mean, busy I'll... bathing them. I can't do everything. <laughs> exactly. No, and you don't have to, yeah. right? <laughs> That's the good news. No, it, it's just with my partner. He um he was uncircumcised as a baby, and then he had an attached foreskin. So he became uncircumcised when he was eight years old, and mm-hmm. and suffered a lot of scar tissue on the on the head of his penis. So he had a lot of shame around his, his penis and what had happened to him. So for him, it, like, I don't know, I don't know if all men, but for him, it was a really, um, powerful experience for him to just get complete with that and accept his penis the way that it was. Yeah. Our oh. partners have all really come on the show and revealed things about themselves and gender equity. And um, we call it gender harmony is something that we've really been a strong stand for, um, throughout yeah. this entire process of, you know, this is, I think the 208th episode. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Gender um, harmony. I like that. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so you have, you have multiple incredible, um, movements and Instagram accounts. And one that really <laughs> also caught our eye was your Instagram account that is reframing losing your virginity, which I like every time I say that, I'm just like, I feel it in my heart. Can you, can you tell us more about that? I want to reframe how I lost my virginity, please. (laughs) (laughs) Let's get, let's get to that too. I mean, I think it's such an important discussion, um, for so many reasons. And it, again, like I was in an orgasmic state when the idea for the orgasm book, Oh, the places you'll go. Oh, Oh, came to me. Um, or maybe I came to it. I don't know. So many puns, you know, when you're talking about pleasure right. and oh, endless, all the, all the puns, endless puns. Endless and puns. <laughs> one of the things that, that I found while I was floating up in that space of creativity was sexual debut. And like, you know, I remember floating back down to my body and the, the idea for the orgasm book was like fully there. And I knew exactly what I had to do. And I said, okay, I'm open now to receiving this, the, the smaller details about how I'm going to pull this off. But I'm like, I'm, I'm aligned, I'm engaged and I'm doing this. And sexual debut was in there and it was written in the book. And I didn't think much of it except for like, Hey, this is a cool new different way to talk about, um, like losing your virginity and to replace it. And what I found was once the book was out in the world, a lot of the messages I got from people was, were like, Hey, 
what is this sexual debut term that you're talking about? And I was like, oh, that's, that's what people are zooming in on. Okay. Let me, let me do a little bit more research into this. And like, you know, where did losing your virginity come from? And like, why is that the term we use? And why is that damaging? And I came across so much information around something called purity culture Mm. and purity rings and pledges that people make to you know not have sex until marriage and and all of these things and again like just a lot of like religious connotation and a lot of oppression and, and whatever and to me like sexual debut is not just a replacement for the term losing your virginity because it's kind of that whole idea of just putting lipstick on a pig like it's not really addressing the underlying issue um my version of sexual debut, the, the one that I stand by, is that your sexual debut is any pinnacle sexual moment where you feel most aligned with yourself. And the reason for that is it can happen multiple times throughout your life. It doesn't necessarily have to be the first time you did something. It could be like the 15th time that you tried something and you have that like, oh my God, I'm, I'm me. Like I've arrived. at at a moment when I'm most like myself. Um, It can also happen at any age. It is, it has nothing to do with penetration, right? Like even just moving away from the term virginity can still carry the hangover of like the Mm. only valid sexual experience is, is heterosexual. Mm. Um, The only thing that can help you or make you transition from one state to the other. And that state being like you know, pure to impure is a penis. None of this made sense to me, especially as we start moving forward with, you know, LGBTQ rights and and trans movements and all of these things where we're trying to like blow open the conversation around sex. Like how can we still have such limiting language that's so impressionable so early on in somebody's Mm -hmm. life? Not Mm -hmm. only that, but it's reinforcing this idea that women are beholden to men for some sort of transition Um, And that sexuality or their sex is something that's outside of them because inherently losing your virginity means that it doesn't even really like your sexuality doesn't really belong to you. It can be lost. It can be stolen. And this has massive psychological consequences or weight for people whose virginity, and I'm putting this in air quotes, you know, is taken from them through a violent act you know Mm. through sexual assault like how are we supposed to then turn around and be like well all of this weight that culturally we've put on this like singular moment of your life that's supposed to then define you um (laughs) by the way that's gone now and let's try to heal you but with sexual Mm. debut it's like Mm. okay we can heal that but just know that this is not the end for you, that you, that, that there are so many sexual debuts in your future because a sexual debut is a choice that you made and it is a moment where you felt most like yourself. And so losing your virginity, let me put it this way. Even if sexual debut isn't where we end up, I want losing your virginity to now be the thing that we're consciously growing away from. Yeah. And speaking to parents, a lot of them didn't even really realize what they were saying when they were talking to their daughters. Like it just like, it just comes out of our mouths. Like we don't even really think about it. So mm-hmm. right. bringing awareness to it and attention to it, at least now has it in our minds as something like, Hey, that is, that is a little weird considering the future that we're trying to create that's my fucking monologue wow no i Fuck yes, <laughs> yes. I i'm so turned on by this mic right now drop. mic drop it's, Boom. What? it's so true because there's so there's such a world inside of it too like instead of like I'm now having sex. It's like I'm not a vir- I'm not a virgin anymore. Mm-hmm. Like there is something good about being a virgin or better than being sexual or like, yeah, like there's this whole, I'm just like mind blown right now. And when I have kids, I'm definitely going to talk about their sexual debut (laughs) instead. (laughs) When I was in seventh grade, I was made up rumors that I had actually had sex with someone and I was a virgin. So I lost my virginity before I even lost my virginity. Yeah. And there was this, it, like, I literally hadn't ever had penetrative sex. And meanwhile, I'm started eighth grade and everyone and their mom, dad, brother, cousin, aunt, rabbi <laughs> knew who I was and my name and quote unquote, what I'd done. Wow. And I hadn't even done it. Right. And so by the time I actually lost, by the time I actually lost my virginity, 
my uh, it was my high school boyfriend. We were, I had a I had a high school boyfriend going into sophomore year. Like I joke about it, but he was my alibi. Mm-hmm. Like I literally my my ninth grade brain was like, "Fuck this! I'm done having people talk shit about me, calling me a slut in the bathroom, going into the stalls, hearing people, hearing girls talk about this thing I never did." And I subconsciously I realized it way later in life, like processing um, through doing a lot of transmissional work. Yeah. And of course, with the podcast and talking about it, realizing that, oh, that was a defense mechanism. I got a boyfriend so people would stop talking shit about me so that he could actually tell everyone, no, I broke her hymen, you guys. Oh like, like it mattered, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's is- also it's also what you had to do to survive inside of that paradigm, right? Well, you know really what I mean? The, like, the so- patriarchal paradigm, you know? Yeah. And we talk, we, in our course, we really distinguish the patriarchal paradigm to a pleasure positive paradigm and really shift this conversation with a list of tools that we mm. teach in our course. So, and you're, you're, you know, you're speaking mm. to the choir once again. So this, yeah. I never thought about this, like, um, sexual debut. It actually reframed my, uh, traumatic experience when I like had my, when I lost my virginity, cause that's how it was framed for me then. So, mm-hmm. um, very powerful shift well and I, yeah and i i even had like a good experience um the first time i had sex it was with a long-term boyfriend and we loved each other and when you said sexual debut i had a visceral reaction because when i had to tell my dad that i was no longer a virgin there was so much shame mm-hmm. around that because mm-hmm. my mom made me tell my dad <laughs> and i'm like I'm like, oh my God. Like I told my mom and I was like, I don't want to tell dad. And she had me tell my dad. And I remember we picked him up from the airport and he was just silent the entire car ride home. And I wanted to like crawl out of my skin. And I didn't, I didn't realize that that was a part of my story until you just said that. And Mm. I get that like, there is a reframe there, whether you had you know, a textbook note, you know, something out of the mm-hmm. notebook or, or like, or a really traumatic experience or anything in between. I'm just like, it makes me want to do a whole series of like having people sharing their, their like story inside of the reframe, like their well, sexual yeah, debut and, stories, you exactly. know? Exactly. And, and the difference too, between, you know, someone losing your virginity or lo- their virginity and their sexual debut, like they're often two different things, right? Because mm. like there, there's always going to be some sort of like monumental feeling more or less around doing something for the first time so we Mm. we can't actually take away like the 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 i don't want to even call it importance but like what the first time tends to mean for people like significant it's it's significant yeah it's a big deal it's a big deal but what the reframing does is says like that doesn't need to be shrouded in shame yeah. and that's not the only thing that's going to happen to you and in no way does this define you as a sexual being right the yeah. the the sexual journey is is ongoing and i think especially now i mean we're privileged to be able to speak about uh you know our varied and changing sexual preferences without feeling like it's going to put our lives in danger um, not everybody has that privilege, but when we allow people to, to truly believe that, Hey, your preferences might change throughout your life and the things that you're going to like, and the people that you're drawn to might not be the same people that it is when you're 15, 16, 17, whatever. Um, and, and that's a beautiful thing. And you actually don't become less for the sexual experiences that you have. Mm. You gain more insight into yourself. Um, Mm. and one thing that I've actually, I don't even know if I've ever said this publicly, but, um, sugar, like your story just kind of instigated it for me, but I actually, I actually started a virginity club in high school to protect myself. So I also had rumors spread about me that I had slept with, I think it was like an entire football team, which like, I don't even know how that's possible, but anyway, like all in one night, I was like, guys, come on. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I started something called um, the V3 Club, which was just like virginity's, what is it? Squared? What's, what's, no, what's the three? What's cubed. the little? Cubed. cubed. Yeah, virginity yeah. cubed. Um, I don't know why exactly, but it was virginity cubed. And 
there was a book that we would pass around between the group where we would write in the book, like, who we were dating, who we were seeing, whatever. And the point of it was that if anybody ever found the book or we needed to prove that we hadn't had sex, we could just be like, look, we talk about all of our, you know, sexual exploits Mm. and none of them are sex. It's just making out. It's just a hand job. It doesn't Mm. matter. And so I created this whole club to protect me from this idea that like I needed to somehow feel ashamed for having done nothing. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I had, it's just like, this idea that, yeah, you're less than because you want to express yourself in that way. I'm sorry right. you went through that. I think that's I'm my sorry you went through long that too. form way of saying like, yeah. I feel you deeply. Yeah, I feel you too, Nicole Hodge. I really do. And I, I noticed that. I think that you've been making clubs since you were, you know, yeah. an adolescent. <laughs> I'm, I'm noticing making here. Yeah. <laughs> making clubs to, to empower wherever you're at in that moment to make a difference yeah. for people who don't have the skills or strengths or gifts that you do. Clearly it's a gift that you have to put yourself in leadership and be like, all right, I'm doing this. Welcome. Let's go. Come right. On. Right. Well, the next um, club, the next club was that... called dirty girls for the record. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you I have to fill you in on something. I'm not a bad girl, but I'm a dirty girl. There you go. <laughs> I have a saying me and my household, we have a saying anytime we shower and someone comes into the, like the common area of our house, We'll be like, ooh, you're so clean. It's time to get dirty. I love that. Uh, Well, Nicole, what, well, I know that we've, um, we've mentioned your book a few times and we talked about the illustrator, but can you, can you like really tell us like a little bit more about your book? Like, what is it about? Um, where can people find it? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's becoming quite apparent to me and like, you know, Sugar, I think you nailed it where, wherever I'm at in my life is what is what I'm creating. And I'm kind of just allowing that to flow through me and just like trusting it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's why people do trust me because I'm very much transparent about the journey that I'm going through and welcoming people into experiencing it alongside Mm -hmm. of me. I'm not, I don't position myself as an expert and I don't even position myself as a teacher. I'm even remiss to say that I, you know, help women learn anything. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering along with you Mm, and mm -hmm. the book is my life up until a very particular point. It was the shame that I overcame in my younger years into the, um, you know, kind of like the, the sexual debut, um, rediscovering my, my pussy. Like there's a, there's a page in the book where this, this girl is standing in front of this giant, um, like pussy portal. And like, that's the moment that I had looked at myself in the mirror, right? It sound, it felt like I was standing in front of this pussy portal and it was like, come on, come on. And, you know, it goes through this like shaming place. It goes through the discovery of, of kink and BDSM. And, and it was the book was so easy in a sense to write because Mm. it was just, I looked at my life the last, you know, whatever it was at like 27 something years at the time. And I just went like, just, just write that. Don't try to write anything you don't know. Just write exactly what your own journey has been. And you know, where, where the book ends is this realization that I had, which is that you know, the answer is in you and you are the key, Mm. you know, but go find out, go find out for yourself. Don't, don't take it from me. Like go on that journey on your own. And, you know, I, I, you know, closed the book in a sense. I, it's, it's, it was ready to put it into the world. And now I'm in the process of writing the next chapter, so to speak. Mm. But Mm. what that book is, is like everything that, again, I wish I had known that because it wasn't, it didn't exist yet. When I went into that realm of creativity and it came to me, I said, okay, I can be the one to help it exist for somebody else. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So well said. Amazing. And um, people can find it on Amazon. Like where can people find it? Yep. Uh, Oh, the places you'll go. Oh, oh, um, 
theorgasmbook.com. If you order it through theorgasmbook.com, the order comes directly to me. And so then I, I can sign it and send it myself. Where can our listeners find you and connect to you? What is the best way for them to, if they want to work with you or just follow your love, your, your Instagram is amazing, <laughs> your website, <laughs> you. all that jazz. Um, I would say the, 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 the kind of starting point would be my Instagram. So that's at Nicole double L it's N I C O L L E the word double and then L I know this will be in the show notes as well. Um, if you go there, it'll give you access to all of the different things that I'm, that I'm working on and you can send me a private message. Um, and then based on kind of what your needs are, I can point you in the right direction. If I'm not the best person to address whatever it is that you're going through, um, I have access to many people who are, are brilliant minds who would be happy to help you. Um, and then the last thing is that every few months I run something called the Garden of Earthly Delights. And it is these, Ooh. it is these women's groups that I get together. Um, and there, there are, there are psychedelics involved. Um, but this is something where if you are in Toronto, um, and you want to attend, I can send you the form to fill out and we can see if, mm. if it makes sense for, for you to come and, and join in on this group. And it's a, it's a growing community where we really do talk about all of the things that have to do with, with being sexual women from, mm. uh, really like sh shedding shame to like what butt plugs we're going to try. <laughs> yeah. I love <laughs> nice. that. That sounds like a good, sounds like a good day to me. <laughs> we, we, we really want to do something called butt plug brunch where everyone, cause we all hate brunch, but we're like, but what if we had butt plugs in? Would that make brunch better? Are you just going to like put little tiny butt plugs in each champagne glass? <laughs> no, they're going to go up our ass, Lindsay. Oh, and then we're going to go to brunch. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> I thought you were just talking about which butt plugs you like, but that sounds like actually way more entertaining. <laughs> Katie would be. Can in. we do? Hold on. Can we please do? A, can we please do our next quarterly clip talk business meeting with butt plugs up our ass? You know what? I will do that. <laughs> okay. Katie's face. Then, nice. then Katie, we can literally right say, yeah. "Look, you're talking like you have something stuck up your ass. What's wrong with you?" I love just kidding that. thank no, you so much I love for that. infusing that into our into our into our corporate culture we really yeah, my we might we might be stealing that one please do <laughs> all right nicole um thank you so much and with that clitorati we're gonna see you next tuesday bye bye bye, -bye. I'm talking about a clit talk, clit talk, clit talk. Talking about a clit talk, clit talk, clit talk. Come on, girls and boys and everyone on the gender rainbow. Bring your pussies to the show.